First Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in St. Albans, Vermont. We are a welcoming community of spiritual seekers, believers, and doubters. Please know that no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, that you are welcome here to travel with us. We have suspended in-person worship until March, but the office is still open Monday through Friday mornings. And if you're interested about learning more about the Bible, please join us Wednesday evenings for an online Bible study. We meet at 7. It's never more than an hour, and it's a lot of fun. After the service at 11 o'clock, we will be having a virtual coffee hour. More details in the email you received this morning. We have quite a few announcements this morning. First, we need your help. Everyone at First Congregational Church, we've been separated for so long due to COVID. We're trying to get together a phone tree. So if you would be willing to volunteer a few hours of your time to call a member of the faith community, we really need your help. Please let the office know by Thursday so we can get it going. Also, the mission board is looking for opportunities to feature the volunteer work that you do in the community that's not associated with the church. So whether you deliver for Meals on Wheels or you volunteer at Martha's Kitchen, let us know. We'd love to take a photo of you and share your story on our Facebook and in our newsletter. And that's it for the announcements. So if you could please join me in the spirit of prayer, and this morning's prayer is recited in unison, so please join me. Eternal God, companion to all who seek you, and seeker to all who turn away from you, draw near to us that we may draw near to you, and grant us the grace to love and to serve you, that we may find in your will our true freedom. Through Christ the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Our opening hymn is found in the Pilgrim Hymnal. It's number 223. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. So if you have the hymnal at home, join in.
God's blessing has been poured out for each and every one of us. Be reminded of that today and every day. Be reminded that God loves you without condition. Amen.
and they were, my sister's name was Jennifer. The three words were Jen, the hen. She could not stand it when I called her Jen the hen. And I would leave messages, Jen the hen, on her table and on her desk. And she would get so angry. And I remember one time I was teasing her, Jen the hen, Jen the hen, hen. And she'd start to chase me. And I turned on my heels and I took off down the hallway and she came after me and she slipped and she went bam, right face down on the floor. She was so angry. Have you ever been angry like that? I bet we've maybe not been that angry, but we've all known what it is to be angry. And sometimes, when we're angry like that, it, it feels a little bit good. We're, we're releasing steam. We're getting a little bit of relief. But it's really, it's not a good place for our hearts to be. So as we grow up, we realize that we want to learn tricks to keep our cool so that we don't go chasing after our little sisters and end up falling on our faces. And one of the things my mother taught me was when I'm feeling like I actually have a picture, this is exactly what my sister looked like. <laughs> so um, when you're feeling like that, uh, my mother taught me this trick, and it's to take a deep breath, and you start to count. You go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, Another deep breath and out. And while that doesn't take the anger away from us, it gives us a little break. And it allows you to step back and think about what you're being angry about. And if you can take a little bit of time and a little bit of a step back, you can control your temper a little bit. And maybe realize that it wasn't that important after all. Because after all, something like Jen the Hen, that's just a name. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for this time together to learn more about how to live on your path. Please help us to maintain our tempers. Help us to take a little breath and count to ten so that we can stay on your path. Amen. is from Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see the great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall not speak to them anything that I did not command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This morning's gospel reading is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was, in their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, throwing him into convulsions and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were amazed. And they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching? With authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the region of Galilee. Here ends this morning's readings. May God add a blessing to our understanding of these words. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength and my redeemer. In last week's reading from Mark, we saw the beginning of Jesus' ministry, preaching the good news, calling his disciples. He calls them not through miraculous events, but through his preaching, his words. This morning we find Jesus continuing his work. He's teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum, and he teaches with authority, not as we are told, as the scribes. The scribes were entrusted with the interpretation of the law and the prophets and its relevant implications to the present. Like a modern day minister or preacher, like me, I'm a modern day scribe. The scribes held a lot of power. After all, they were in control of the teaching of what people learned, the message they took away from the synagogue, and how people led their everyday life. That's a lot of influence. It's a lot of power. And to quote 19th century English historian John Dahlberg Acton, power tends to corrupt. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. The problem with this kind of influence is that one can skew things to one's own advantage. The advantage can take the form of obvious abuse, say, embezzling money. But more often, it's something much more subtle. That advantage can be simply trying to keep one's job secure, which can lead to trying not to rock the boat, trying not to offend anyone in the congregation, making the road smooth. When we do this, and it's easy to do, we make light of the teaching, or we end up watering it down so much that it becomes meaningless. So Jesus is in the port town of Capernaum, which is on the Sea of Galilee. He's in the synagogue, teaching with authority. I wonder what he said. I'm sure whatever he said, he didn't mince words. And he really showed up the scribes and the people who were teaching and in charge of that. I wonder how they felt about Jesus. Can you imagine? You're the expert in your community, and some random guy comes into the synagogue and starts astonishing your flock with his teaching. I don't know that I'd be that happy about that. I think I'd be embarrassed. And while I'd like to think I'd be welcoming and open, I think I'd be a little jealous. As most of you know, I used to be a street pastor. And one of the nice things about being a street pastor, and I love the most, was that I'd be asked to preach at area churches that supported the ministry. Now, not being the settled minister there, I didn't have to worry about offending anyone. I could be a strong advocate for justice, for the homeless, for the addicted, the mentally ill, the traumatized. I could stand up for them and advocate them as much as the gospel allows, which is a lot. I'd be frank. i call people out. And people liked that strong prophetic voice, that no-holds-barred approach. It's something that our ministry was really known for. So when I was applying to be your minister here, my friends and cohorts in the street ministry joked with me. Jessica, whatever you do, do not 
open your mouth. And boy, Jess, I wonder how long you'll last. See, I have a reputation for not being a politic person, and I know this. So when I came here, I was clean, keenly aware of my weakness, which can lead to a type of hypercorrection. I hope it doesn't. All I know is that I'm aware of the pitfalls. I'm aware of what it's like to try to coordinate and accommodate a group of people. And it's easy to spend one's time concentrating on that one element and not on the central message of the gospel. So you see, I really feel for the scribes. And I'm glad to get that reminder through a story in the Bible, rather than the open humiliation the scribes experienced when Jesus came and taught. So reading the rest of the passage with that in mind, we find Jesus teaching with authority, and immediately, a man with an unclean spirit appears and says, what have you to do with us? Which, according to New Testament professor Eckhart Schnabel, is another way of saying, go away and leave us alone. I wonder. Could that man with an unclean spirit be an angry scribe, consumed by jealousy, possessed by his desire to stay in a position of power? What is meant by unclean spirit? Does it really need to be a supernatural demon? Could it instead be something that we're more or even very familiar with? Could it be anger, jealousy, hatred, pride, fear? All those things can possess us. Growing up, I was the youngest of my friends, and they, they all got their driver's licenses before me. So when I turned 16, I didn't need to get my license because everyone else had their license. And being a typical teenage girl, we travel in packs. But then college came, and I needed to commute into school, into Boston. So I had to get my license and I got it one week before class began. My first day's driving, it was kind of like baptism by fire. The first day, I hit a car while I was parking, completely smashed its door. In the same week, I had one of the scariest experiences of my young life. I was leaving Cambridge, and I accidentally got into the wrong lane. And it's not easy to get out of these lanes, it's very congested. So I realized I was in the wrong lane, and I kind of just hopped over into another lane. Didn't really look in my mirrors. Certainly didn't turn around and look. And I cut someone off. And as I looked in the rear view mirror, I saw that I cut off a businessman. I cut off a businessman wearing a three-piece suit. I cut off a very angry businessman in a three-piece suit with this bulging vein in his forehead. He lay on his horn and gesticulated, you can imagine. And I waved. I was a cute 19-year-old and I played my cuteness for all it was worth. It wasn't worth much. So I sped to the next light trying to get away from him. And waiting at the light, I looked at my rearview mirror again, and he made eye contact with me. I'm not kidding you. He was mad, seething. He hated me. I thought the vein in his forehead would just burst. He was out of control, and I was afraid he would follow me. And he did. I was too scared to pay attention to where I was going, so I just got on the road, just kept going straight. I ended up leaving Cambridge, going into Boston. I got lost with this possessed man in hot pursuit. I started to get angry. I felt like if he caught up to me, I'd give him what for. Lost and furious on the streets of Boston. I was very familiar with Boston, but 
always on foot, not in a car. So there are all these one-way streets and turn-only lanes. And somehow I made it into the combat zone, which if you don't know, is the red light district. Just my luck. We're tearing around and really I realized we were just doing this big circle. And I didn't know what to do. And then my savior appeared. It was a cabbie. And he pulled right out in front of me. And it was a really nice looking taxi. So I decided to follow him, thinking that he'd end up at the airport or at a nice hotel or somewhere that I could get help. So I followed him, while being followed by this angry businessman with the bulging vein in his head. At that point, I remember thinking it was kind of comical. This threesome touring Boston. And I wondered if the cabbie knew I was following him. And did he see a middle class girl completely out of place and scared out of her mind? Did he recognize my fear? I think he did. We continued to follow the cabbie through a maze of streets, and I felt more turned around than ever. And then the cabbie drove us right to the Tobin Bridge. Pedal to the metal, I sped onto Route 1, crossed the bridge, headed home. And my nemesis, he stayed in Boston. Was my pursuer possessed by a demon? Some unclean spirit? I recognized it in him. Because I knew what it was like to be possessed by that kind of anger. What teenage kid filled with angst doesn't know that anger? His anger controlled the situation. His anger controlled me. I fed right into it. If I hadn't tried to speed away, if I hadn't tried to give him the cute wave, would he have even bothered? When he looked at me, it was like he was calling me out in a way similar to the way the unclean spirit names Jesus. I could just hear him in my head. Look, you little witch. I know who you are, you spoiled little daddy's girl. And I let his anger take possession of me. I responded in a way that validated his anger. In his song, uh, You Have Loved Enough, Canadian poet and songwriter, Leonard Cohen writes, when hatred with his package comes, you refuse delivery. It's about his spiritual teacher. It's profound. Anger meeting anger feeds more anger more possession. Anger gains control of the situation. Anger, jealousy, hatred, fear. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says, do not resist the evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. In essence, don't meet violence with violence. Don't feed evil. Don't feed hatred. Don't feed anger. Refuse that delivery. Don't take it. And I think that's what Jesus does in this reading. The unclean spirit recognizes Jesus and names him. Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. In the ancient world, naming something or someone gives you control over them. So the unclean spirit tries to wrest control from Jesus. But he can't. Jesus simply silences him and exercises the, clean, the unclean spirit. Jesus doesn't engage on the level of the unclean spirit. Jesus doesn't say, yeah, well, so is your mother. Jesus doesn't get into a did not, did too kind of argument. He simply let it go. He doesn't feed into the hatred. And ultimately, the unclean spirit withers. It leaves. It tries to give a fight, but there's nothing to fight. There's nothing giving it resistance. There is no tension for it to fight against. But let's not think that Jesus was passive. He wasn't. He didn't back down. He acted with intention. He just didn't play the game by actively not matching the unclean spirit's energy. And by doing so, he diffused the situation. The peace worker in me sees this as nonviolent direct action. 
In our Bible study on Wednesday night, we were discussing the unclean spirit. And the question was posed, where did the unclean spirit go? Which also led, where does it come from? Gerard made a great analogy. He said, perhaps the unclean spirit is like a virus. It's out there, but it needs a host to live and thrive. But unlike the virus, we have a choice. We don't need to be the host. We can simply disengage. We can turn the other cheek, put on our masks. Easier said than done, at least for me. It seems to me to be the opposite of my nature to back down, to diffuse. My hard wiring is pretty combative. And I know I'm not alone in that. But so much of what Jesus asks of us is that way. He calls into question and upsets so many things that we take for granted. From the status quo of the synagogue by teaching with true authority, to actively not engaging with hatred, anger, and fear. By doing that, he helps open us, open us up to a new reality. Helps us see what we can be how we can live, how we can create the beloved community here and now. Amen. Our second hymn this morning, if I can get my hands on it, in the Pilgrim Hymnal, number 398, Hope of the world. We're singing verses one and two. Mm -hmm.
ask for your help and guidance as we navigate our tumultuous world with new awareness, realizing that turning a blind eye is not the same as turning the other cheek. Help us to work for justice and equality with loving and open hearts. This morning, we pray especially for those affected by the coronavirus, its victims, their family members, health care workers. We pray for everyone who has, been especially, has to be especially careful for the virus. May their isolation keep them safe, and may they know that we support and pray for them. We pray for a speedy recovery for Judy after her knee surgery. We offer healing prayers for Vivian. And this morning I'd like to ask especially for prayers for the homeless community in Portland with the recent outbreak of COVID-19 in their homeless shelter. May God grant us peace and understanding. In your holy name we pray. Amen. If you would please join us for the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.